be talking about on Gugi Chiango's novel, Devil on the Cross. I've taught this novel several times and I always learn something new about it. And I also enjoy teaching it and my students seem to love it as well. So in this brief lecture, I'll be talking about, you know, what are some of the interesting things to look for in the novel, but also what the novel can teach us in terms of our life in the world. So first briefly about the author himself, Ngugi Chiango is a great name in African literature. He's originally from Kenya. And what's peculiar about his way of writing and his politics is to understand that he belongs to that one particular group in African studies and African literatures who believe that it is imperative on the post-colonial nations from Africa to start producing literature in their own native languages. And he explains this extensively in his book, Decolonizing the Mind. Because his argument in the book is that the colonial educational system didn't just privilege colonial languages. What it also did was it psychologically made the students, the native students, to internalize this idea that somehow the European languages were better, but also that their own languages were inferior. Furthermore, since language has a direct connection with culture, that would then also somehow unconsciously convince these students as if their own culture was also inferior. So Ngugi's recipe as a writer and as an artist is that the native authors from African nations must constantly produce work in their own native languages so that people from the nations, for example, Kenya from where Ngugi is from, can read their own stories in their language and in the process internalize the idea that their own cultures are worth respect and love as well. And Devil on the Cross was the first novel that Ngugi himself originally wrote in Gikuyu, right? And that was his transition from writing his works in English to Gikuyu. And there are quite a few apocryphal stories about the novel. For example, uh, it is believed that Ngugi wrote the novel on toilet paper while he was imprisoned for producing a radical play. And that when he came out of the prison, uh, he approached a local publisher who published it. And then a strange thing happened. The novel, reading it in bars, on the farms, they started telling the story of the novel as if it was an oral tale. And these are some of the stories about the novel. Now, if you read it carefully, uh, first of all, and it's her story of becoming a fully realized subject with agency. But the novel destroys the usual romantic view of coming to this self, which we believe that an individual alone can do that, those mythologies that we believe in, that we alone can take care of our own destiny. Because what the novel teaches us is that she reaches to her agency, not simply because of her own effort, but because of the enabling conditions created by other workers, other people around her who, first of all, support her, but also help her see the world as it is and help her define her place in it. So in a way, this is coming to yourself, coming to your voice through acts of solidarity. So that's an important thing that the novel teaches us. Now, Ngugi also uses a very peculiar and interesting framing device for the novel. Now, no, the novel is deeply critical of the elite politics of the Kenyan post-colony, the country and what it becomes after the freedom itself. So in the beginning, the story is told by the Gikandi player, the traditional Gikuyu storyteller and poet. And uh, he declares in the beginning, he knows uh, that people will object to the representation in the novel because there are a lot of critical things said about Kenya and how it functions as a nation. So he says, and I'm kind of paraphrasing, he says, well, what do you want me to do as a storyteller? If I see holes in my yard, do I point them out or do I cover them with leaves? And, 
and take the risk that my children would fall into it. So this framing enables Ngugi to then uh, provide a scathing critique of how Kenya as a nation is being run by the elite. Then there are also themes in the novel where the narrative and the actions of the moneyed elite are connected to the European nations, the capitalist, as well as uh, the former colonizers, which suggests to us that even though the colonizers have left, uh, they still have deep contacts within the post-colonial nation state. And they also govern the agenda through their local comrades, the rich people who exploit their own people to, to create their huge wealth. So there is a very strong critique of not just capitalism, but neoliberal capitalism and neoliberal cap capitalism as defined and articulated and practiced from the West, from the former colonies. Now, Waringa, you know, in the beginning of the novel, she is fired from her job because she refuses to acquiesce to the demands of her boss, the sexual uh, demands. And she's evicted from her house and literally thrown on the street and shows she has enough money to buy a ticket to Ilmarog to go back to her family. We know that she has no living parents. The only family she had was the family of the uncle who had adopted her, but who had also exploited her. But on her way there, uh, in an extreme form of desperation, she meets a few people, right? She first of all meets Gotaria, who is from the rich elite class, but he's your typical liberal artist academic who teaches at the University of Nairobi and his mission is to write great African music in the same tradition, in the same van, vein as, as you know, operatic music of the West. So he's deeply interested in the people and their songs and their stories. So in a way he is, he represents the elite nationalist, the highly educated nationalist. And we also meet uh, uh, Mutori who's a worker, has always been a worker, and Wangari, who's an older woman, but she and Muthori were both part of the independence movement, and Wangari actually was part of the Mau Mau rebellion. And through these two characters and their conversations, Ngugi shares with us, you know, how the people, especially if they're politically aware, think of their lives after the independence and that we learn that they they know who is exploiting them and how injustices are being done to the people and how the promise of the nation that it will create a wonderful egalitarian space for the people who had fought for their freedom has not been fulfilled. And I think the most crucial scene in that realization, in that learning is when they all go to the staged meetings in the Cape, right? Uh, to which they had gotten mysteriously an invitation. Because when they go there, it's it's an event. It's organized by seven people from free Europe. They are all financiers. And they've come to Kenya to hear claims of certain people who can prove to them how they're best at exploiting the people. And one of them is going to be given an award. And if you read that section carefully, I mean, it's hyperbole, but you also learn that these people have no qualms about exploiting their own people. And while they are making those speeches, Waringa and her group are watching it. And in a way, it's a didactic moment for Waringa because she just realized, oh, this is the truth of the world in which I live, in which I have been exploited. So they walk out of there. And then we are given some backstory of Waringa. And we realize that Gautaria's father was the person, the rich man who had sexually exploited her when she was a young girl and actually literally had destroyed her future. And towards the end, it is when they go to meet his father that she realizes that he is the old man who had exploited her. And at the end of the novel, you know, Waringa shoots her oppressor and walks out of there. And as she walks out of there, she becomes this mythical fighter figure. We don't know what happens to her. It's an open ending, but we know that her life has changed and that 
she is self-reliant and she has just destroyed the very person who had destroyed her life and that's where the novel leaves us now within the novel there is also of course the question of the title what does it mean devil on the cross and Ngugi stages it for us through a recurring dream that Waringa sees, right? And in the dream, she sees the devil who's wearing a three-piece suit, has an umbrella, has been captured by the people, and people are bringing him to this huge cross, and they crucify him, and they crucify him for exploiting the poor, for being excessively greedy, and for basically plundering the people's wealth. And then there is, you know, um, Three days later, the devil's followers come down and pull him up, and there is a certain kind of, an, uh, you could say, secular resurrection. So the devil, of course, in the novel, or devil on the cross is, we don't know, but maybe it's the figure of capital itself, or capitalistic greed, or that class that basically exploits people. So it's crucial to dwell a little on the title and on the, the dream that uh, Ngugi uh, repeats a number of times in the novel. Overall, as a teacher and student of literature, I think what the novel is ex really teaches us and has the capacity to teach us is not just about Kenya and how the promise of the nation state has gone wrong, but it's it can teach us about you know how the world works. How does global capitalism work? How is it that the elite, the, the wealth keeps getting concentrated and that wherever you go in the world, including the United States and elsewhere, people who sell their labor, the workers, their rights are constantly diminished and taken over by those with immense wealth. And maybe if we read that and extrapolate from that, uh, we can think the world differently. And I think that's what the novel encourages its Kenyan readers to do. But it also encourages everyone else, people who are part of the proletariat or the cognitariat, people who must sell their labors to sustain their life. Uh, maybe it teaches us also not just how the world works, how do the rich become rich, but also how do we build solidarities? How is it? How do we come together, learn from each other, and then maybe respond to this huge uh, demon, this devil on the cross called capitalism? And how do we create a world in which majority of the world, which is the people who are poor, can have a decent and, and you know, honorable access to life and uh, what the planet has to offer? So these are some of my thoughts on the novel. Uh, if you have any questions, I will post this on my website. And you can always post the questions under the video here or uh, on my website, and I'll be very happy to answer them. And so thank you so much for joining me. And uh, please stay tuned for other such lectures. And if you have any suggestions, uh, please feel free to share, and I will try to cover those texts. Thank you so much.